Today's lecture is on financial management, insurance, and billing functions. Claims management, the why and how. Patient charges. Patients are charged for the care received. We have write-offs. At times, it is necessary to write off patient charges or balances on their accounts. This shows an accounting of the visit and charges, yet the practice would not add those charges into the accounts receivable. And writing off means to adjust the balance accordingly so it reflects no money owed. Written claims management process. Each step must be efficient and effective and includes written financial policies. How much is charged per service? What is the fee schedule? This is the amount charged for services rendered in a physician's office by current procedural terminology or CPT code. The timing of filing claims, the follow-up on unpaid claims and collections procedures when claims are not paid. The use of PM software. It improves the efficiency of a claims process. It allows for accurate capturing of charges, submits automatic reminders, offers a variety of reporting options, and provides automatic follow-up on each account. Less chance of missed charges, missed payments, and payments posted to the wrong accounts than with the manual systems. And each patient is entered only once in the practice's database. Encounters, such as office visits, are attached to the master entry. Each encounter or visit has an account attached to it. The claims process must be fulfilled for each of those accounts. And PM software helps track claims and payments for each encounter. The patient's account for each visit begins when the appointment is made. Ask the patients for at least two personal identifiers. It ensures that the correct account is pulled up for the appointment and it prevents duplication of account creation. Examples of unique personal identifiers include name, date of birth, or medical record number. Not too many people know their medical record number, right? Ask for expected source of payment. Discuss policies for patients paying out of pocket. Verify or update insurance information for patients with insurance coverage. Insurance coverage includes government plans, which is Medicare for patients over 65 years old or those with qualifying disabilities, and Medicaid, patients who qualifies as financially indigent. TRICARE, military service members and their families. All right, those are government plans. Now we have other plans. Private insurance, such as Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare. Um, there are many different types of insurance coverages in different areas of the United States. So we'll just stick with Blue Cross Blue Shield and um, United Healthcare for now. We have group insurance types, indemnity, which are fee for service plans, and managed care. Most of us are on an HMO or a PPO. Managed care promotes quality, cost effective healthcare and it focuses on monitoring patients, preventive care, and performance measures of providers. Manage care models. Physicians contract with plans to provide care at a predetermined rate, and the rate is paid out per member per month in one predetermined payment. And when you have an HMO and the predetermined rate for your care is $90 and the physician charges $120, you are not balance billed because the practice agrees that $90 is payment in full. So you cannot be balance billed when you have an HMO. Insurance verification typically occurs prior to the patient's arrival for the appointment. And it's the process of contacting the insurance carrier. Receives validation of coverage for the patient. If there is a deductible, then the amount the patient pays, which is the amount the patient pays before insurance begin, coverage begins. Co-payment amount is a fixed amount due at the time of each visit. Co-insurance is the percentage that the carrier pays and the patient pays. So if you have a co-insurance, your deductible is $1,000 every year, and you've already paid $1,000 for health care, the next time you go to your doctors, your insurance benefits will begin to be applied. If your insurance benefits are 80% paid by the insurance company and 20% paid by you, your co-insurance is 20% of the bill. And this um, validation of coverage verifies that services provided qualify to be covered by the health insurance plan.
Outpatient patient flow. Patient calls for appointment and provides information relevant to the visit. Patient arrives at appointment and checks in at the front desk. A healthcare professional takes the patient's vital signs and begins documentation for the visit in the exam room. Documents a chief complaint, the history of the present illness, medication review, health history review, and then the patient is seen by the care provider. A diagnosis is rendered and charges are applied to the bill. The patient checks out and the claim submission process begins. Patient check out is called discharge in an inpatient hospital setting. The paper encounter form or the super bill is used to capture the diagnoses and services or procedures performed. It is a hard copy on paper. It can be computer generated by the practice management system or it can be all electronically submitted with no paper whatsoever. It's known as the following. It's called a super bill, an encounter form, or a routing slip. Some practices still use paper forms and then have the information entered into the system. Other practices are directly 100% on a computer system. Information from the super bill is transferred to the CMS 1500 form, and this is done through the computer system. Um, people do not do this. This is known as the insurance claim form, and it's used to bill outpatient encounters. So once the information is in the system, it automatically populates the insurance claim form. And then your billers go over the insurance claim form to make sure everything is filled in and all the documentation is needed, is there. Hard copy super bills typically include the following elements. Name and address of the medical practice, the provider's NPI, the patient's name, patient's chart number, or medical record number, the date and time of visit, CPT codes for common procedures performed in the office, a diagnosis narrative as written by the care provider in the SOAP note, and an ICD-10-CM code corresponding to each written diagnosis. So the ICD-10-CM codes are diagnostic codes. They answer the question, why are you here? My ear hurts. The CPT codes are procedure codes, and there's two questions for CPT codes. Where did you go? And what did you have done? Super bills generated by PM systems may still be printed. Identifying information is automatically generated. Medical necessity. The fact that there is a medical reason to perform a procedure or service. A documentation must exist in the patient's record to show the signs, symptoms, or history to demonstrate that the procedures are medically necessary. These don't always go along with the bills, but the insurance company may say, we'd like to see the the SOAP note, we want to see the medical necessity, why you did this procedure. Documentation must exist in the patient's record to show the signs, symptoms, or history to demonstrate that the procedures are medically necessary. We call this code linkage, and it's used on insurance claims to show the relationship between a procedure code and a diagno diagnosis code. So every procedure must link to a diagnosis. All right, the diagnosis was. Um, Decreased hearing in the right ear. The procedure was an ear lavage to remove wax. And so the, the procedure code matches the diagnosis. Here's one example. A diagnosis of pneumonia could be linked to a procedure code for a chest x-ray. These demonstrate that the procedure was medically necessary and appropriate. Proper documentation must be provided to support diagnoses and procedures. Code linkage must be accurate and appropriate to avoid claim denial and rejection. The claims process using Prime Suite. Co-payment, also refer, referred to as a copay. The amount due from the patient at the time of the office visit, usually from an HMO. Typically a requirement of managed care plans and their fixed amounts. Example, if a patient's copay is $25 for office visits, then that is the fixed payment for every office visit. Because copayments do not change, they are usually collected at the time of arrival or during checkout. Not relevant to inpatient hospital visits. There are no copays for inpatient hospital visits. Your coinsurance is a form of cost sharing required by some insurance plans. Both the carrier and the patient are responsible for a percentage of the charges. Based on the insurance carrier's allowed charges, here's an example. Medicare often has an 80-20 coinsurance. This means that the insurance carrier pays 80% of Medicare's allowed charges and the patient pays 20%. And this is why a lot of Medicare recipients have a supplemental insurance to cover the 20%. 
The amounts due are relative to the charges because they are based off of percentages. Often, the patient is billed the, for the remaining balance after the insurance carrier has paid its portion. If you have two insurances, then the balance from the first insurance is sent to the second insurance. Here's examples. Patients with 80-20 coinsurance versus patients with a $25 copay. So for all of these, the patient with a copay is only paying $25. But if you have an office charge of um, $50 for a patient with an 80-20 payment plan, then 80% of $50 is $40 and the patient pays his 20%, which is $10. It's easier to understand this with a $100 office charge. The patient, the, the insurance pays 80%, which is $80. And the patient pays 20%, which is $20. It just happens to work that way. Now, if you have a $250 office charge with the 80-20 plan, the patient's going to pay 50% and the insurance pays 200. And the 400 office charge is like the 100 office charge, just multiply the answer by four. So the patient with an 80-20 coinsurance plan would pay 80% of 400, which is $80, uh, or excuse me, would pay $320 and the patient would pay $80. Alerts. In practice management software, alerts can be generated as reminders. Examples, patient has a copay. Verify that deductible has been met. All right. And so these, when you, when the front office, the, the registration person opens up and puts in Jane Doe, and it says patient has a copay, collect. Or um, verify that deductible has been met. And this happens when the insurance card is put through the little black like sausage thing and it validates what's there. It also, the information comes up on the screen. It's genera generated based on the patient's insurance plan. Medical insurance contract under which a patient is covered. The extent to which services are covered um, are um, part of the plan, and we call this the plan. Now, don't ask your doctor's office how much you, you know, if how much your plan pays, because they deal with hundreds of plans a day. That's why you need to call the number on the back of the card and ask for your benefit information if you don't understand it. It is not the doctor, doctor's office responsibility to know what your plan covers and doesn't cover. Diagnosis and procedure coding using Prime Suite. Coding patient encounters. Care providers document patient encounters in an EHR or paper chart. And any diagnosis assigned to the patient and any procedure or service performed is coded. Diagnoses and procedures must be coded. Coding converts the written terms to nationally recognized alphanumeric or numeric coding systems, which ensures that insurance carriers across the nations are speaking the same language because they all have to use the same codes. This is necessary for filing insurance claims. It assists with gathering statistics of conditions treated and procedures performed. Again, I'll use the flu epidemic. We hear 20% of the country, 40%, 500 cases, we know that because of the codes, these diagnostic codes used in patient records. It allows for code linkage. It shows the relationship between a procedure performed and a supporting diagnosis to show medical necessity. An improper code linkage results in claim denial. Again, if the procedure, if the diagnosis, the SOAP note, written note does not support the procedure, you're not going to get paid. ICD-10-CM are the International Classification of Diseases 10th Revision Clinical Modification, and it's used to classify diseases and conditions diagnosed in any healthcare setting, any healthcare setting, inpatient and outpatient, and it's used to recall, record cause of death on death certificates. The ICD-10-CM codes answer the question, why are you here? What hurts? What happened? Why are you here? The ICD-10-PCS is the International Classification of Diseases 10th Revision Procedure Coding System for inpatient coding used by hospitals to code procedures. And these are done with diagnostic related groups, not by individual, um, individual codes, but for group codes. CPT is the current procedural terminology. It's used to code procedures in outpatient settings. The CPT codes answer two questions. Where did you go? And what did you have done? So ICD-10 is, why are you here in the doctor's office? And CPT are, where did you go? Doctor's office, ER, rehab center. 
and what did you have done? A little information on diagnosis coding, ICD-10-CM, used in both inpatient and outpatient settings to code diagnoses. Every encounter has at least one code. The first listed is the most closely related to the reason for the encounter, the chief complaint, and it's used to support rationale for medical necessity of procedures. So procedure coding, ICD-10-PCS is used in inpatient facilities or hospitals to code procedures. CPT is used in outpatient facilities to code procedures. It's any service or procedure performed is assigned a code, and it must be supported by a reasonable diagnostic code. So here's your code linkage. And CPT codes also tell us where you went for the, for the care. It's called an evaluation and management code. PICS -PIC is the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System. And it's a coding system required by Medicare and Medicaid to document services and procedures. HCPCS Level 1 is the CPT coding system for procedures and services we just talked about. And HCPCS Level 2 is the coding system for equipment, supplies, and transport. And these HCPCS codes are used for Medicare patients and Medicare patients, Medicaid patients. Blue Cross Blue Shield has been asking for HCPCS codes, but they are not mandatory, so a lot of offices are not putting them in. These HCPCS codes are used to code equipment such as walkers, canes, hospital beds for home use, supplies, bandages, tape, ostea, um, ostomy supplies, oxygen supplies, and for transport, such as ambulance transportation. Relationship between documentation and coding. It's ne documentation is necessary. All services rendered to patients must be documented. Face-to-face -face time with the care provider, the treatment, the diagnostic test, the procedures. Services and procedures cannot be billed to the insurance carrier unless they are shown to be medically necessary. Sufficient documentation is needed to support medical necessity, signs, symptoms, and history, and the code linkage demonstrates the relationship between diagnoses and procedures. So what is something that won't get paid? If you go in for a blood pressure check and you have your ears cleaned out and they post that you had your ears cleaned out. They put in the CPT code for that, the CPT code for a blood pressure check. Your soap note says you have a history of hypertension, but it doesn't say anything about ear pain or loss of hearing. And when that happens, then the ear lavage doesn't get paid for. It gets denied. So you have to document everything you do. Document, document, document. What is fraud? It's intentional deception. You purposely deceive someone or, or, in a sense, tell a lie. In healthcare, fraud takes advantage of a patient, an insurance company, or Medicare and Medicaid. And it's where you are performing services that aren't necessary, or we call this upcoding, where you code services that were not actually performed, or you code for a more complex service than the one performed. That's called upcoding. What are accountable care organizations? This is an original Medicare program, and it's typically fee for service, and some managed care models are available. Services rendered are reimbursed as long as they are medically necessary. The Affordable Care Act, the ACA, was signed into law in 2010 and resulted in improved access to affordable health care coverage, provides protection from abusive practices by healthcare insurance companies. Again, it provides protection from abusive practices by healthcare insurance companies. And it focuses on high quality coordinated care with patient input. Reimbursement is tied to quality and efficient use of healthcare services and overall patient satisfaction. The Affordable Care Act is also known as Obamacare. The Accountable Care Organization is a reimbursement model where hospitals, physicians, and other health care providers form partnerships, and it's all are accountable for the quality of patient care. So there is now a partnership. Your doctor sends you to this doctor who says we're going to do a hip replacement. So you go to the hospital, then you go to rehab, and then you go to outpatient therapy. This is the partnership of care that's taking care of you. Partnerships work together to provide cost effectiveness and efficiency, and they focus on patient satisfaction. It is a pay for performance model of healthcare reimbursement. Medicare's six ACO models. The Medicare Shared Savings Program. 
This transitions current Medicare fee-for-service providers to the ACO model. It helps to transition them into that model. The ACO investment model is for Medicare Shared Savings Program, as ACOs, to test prepaid savings in rural and underserved areas. So let's say this again. It's for Medicare Shared Savings Program, like the one above, ACOs, Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs, to test prepaid savings in rural and underserved areas. The advanced payment ACO model is supplementary incentive model open only to providers in the shared savings program. The comprehensive ESRD care initiative is designed for beneficiaries who are in end stage renal disease, ESRD, receiving dialysis. The next generation ACO model is for ACOs that are experienced in managing care for various populations of patients. And the pioneer ACO model is for healthcare organizations that are currently experienced in the coordination of care for patients. So learn the six differences, the six types, and, and uh, what they stand for, please. ACO participation is voluntary, and Medicare patients do not see changes to coverage. It's the providers who see the changes, and it provides coordinated care. Participating hospitals, providers, and ancillary service, such as physical therapy, providers must be able to share information. So the EHR and the interoperable systems make data sharing possible. So we're going way back to the first lecture in, in this book on interoperability, that systems need to talk between each other. Now we see that with this ACO program, you need all these different providers to talk between themselves, the hospitals, the providers, the rehab centers, the outpatient therapy, the pharmacies, to make sure that all the data on the patient is there and the correct information is used in prescribing and taking care of the patient. Approximately 30 quality measures are monitored relating to patient experience satisfaction, care coordination, and patient safety. The higher the quality of care, the higher the shared earnings by the ACO. And its structured data by use of codes allow for measurements of quality. Pretty amazing, huh? Accounts receivable, getting paid, money coming into the practice. Is money being paid from the medical practice? Um, accounts payable. First it says accounts receivable. Now accounts payable. Is the money being paid from the medical practice and paying their bills? Supplies, rent, utilities, and payroll. That's accounts payable. Accounts receivable is money coming into the practice from insurance payments and payments made by patients. What are transactions? These are posting of charges, payment of claims in the practice management system, and updates to patient accounts. These are transactions. Where did the money go? It came in from Blue Cross Blue Shield. We have on our remittance advice seven patients, so we're going to do, send the money to the seven patients' accounts according to the remittance advice. All right, and insurance company payments are multiple ways to pay providers electronically, by check, by automatic deposit into the practice's bank account. Payments may be for more than one patient's care, submitted with detailed accounting of claims for which payments are being paid. And this is called the remittance advice, the RA. This is the document that accompanies insurance payments. And it's a detailed accounting of claims for which payment is being made by the insurance company. It shows which procedures were paid for which patients. It shows any claim denials or reduced payments and reasons for those denials or reduced payments. Now, an explanation of benefits is a little different. It looks like a remittance, remittance advice, but it's sent to the subscriber, to the guarantor, to the person who gets the insurance. So if you have five in your family and you're the one who provides the insurance, you are the subscriber. And it's a, the primary person covered by the insurance plan. It explains the charges for service, amount paid by the insurance company, and the amount that, that may be owed by the patient or the balance that's being written off. Elements typically included on a remitt remittance advice or explanation of benefits. We have the provider's name and NPI, National Provider Identifier. The patient's name, the claim number, and the medical record number. The date or dates of service. The claim status, open, denied, paid, more information needed, rejected. 
electronic transaction number when it's applicable. The service details, so it will show CPT codes that were billed for, the amount charged for each code, and the allowed amount, which is the amount the insurance company agreed to pay. The copay paid by the patient will show, and there'll be an adjusted amount. Now, the adjusted amount doesn't mean the patient has to pay this. It just means that this is the amount that's not being paid. If this is an HMO, then the practice writes off that amount. If this is an 80-20 plan, whether it's private insurance or Medicare, then the patient is responsible for the 20% unless they have a second insurance, and then it goes to the second insurance. It has a recap of charges and payments, total charges and covered charges, charges not covered or denied, and a glossary of explanation codes. And choose me at the bottom of the um, page. Understanding the claims process and receiving payments. After the patient has completed services or procedures, an insurance claim is completed based on the super bill or the encounter form, the provider's documentation, and the appropriate code linkage. The claim is completed and double checked for accuracy, and then it's submitted to and received by the insurance carrier. Now, sometimes it doesn't go right to the insurance company. It will go to a clearing house that makes sure that everything is in the right place, that the code linkage is right, all the information is correct, and then it will send it off to the insurance carrier. Now the claim undergoes the adjudication process. And this is the process of reviewing claims to determine payment. They can be paid, denied, or partially paid. Claims undergo the adjudication process once they are received by the insurance carriers. And the, the claims payment is determined by the completeness, accuracy, and code linkage of the claim. Once a determination has been made, the insurance carrier notifies the provider by sending a RA or remittance advice with payment. Notification of decision and any items that need correction or sub resubmission are also on the RA. The patient receives an explanation of benefits. The practice then posts payments to specific charges in patients' accounts. Remaining balances are sent to patients or billed to a secondary insurance. Managing accounts receivable in Prime Suite. Management of patient accounts. Charging patients, tracking accounts receivable and collections, requires setting up parameters for each insurance carrier and their plans. And plans can differ by co-payments and co-insurance requirements, as well as deductibles, the extent of coverage, and the rules of filing of claims, because each insurance company does things a little differently. And the system should be implemented that efficiently applies the various policies to the correct patient. That's a lot of programming. Libraries and databases are used in practice management systems to perform functions within the different applications. So you have an insurance company library where all insurance companies and individual plans represented by the patients in the practice are listed. You have ICD-10-CM, you have CPT, and HCFIX Level 2 code tables, and they must be maintained annually to account for changes. Every January 1st, all of those codes are updated. So there's a brand new set of codes that come through on January 1st. And the software program, the company who runs your program, will put those changes in. There's a fees schedule listed by CPT code, and it includes charges for each service. Reports, such as aging reports, or the length of times claims have been unpaid, are set up to allow for timely tracking and following up of claims. Alerts, and these are reminders to office staff related to billing functions, such as co-pays due, write-offs, and overdue balances. Using PM software accomplishes filing, follow-up, and collection of claims. It allows electronic remittance of claims and a electronic receipt of payment from insurance carriers. Healthcare professionals can see updates on claims at any point in the process. The collection procedures are streamlined. The reports of accounts are ready for collections are sent electronically, and the office can see the status of the account. And advantages of using PM software are greater billing accuracy, less chance of lost charges and revenue, and fewer mistakes. So many fewer mistakes. Evaluation and management codes. And again, these are the CPT codes that say, where did you go for your service? All right. And CPT codes are used to capture face-to-face -face time between a patient and a care provider. They're called evaluation and management codes. And you have to consider the extent of the history. I have a sore throat. 
The extent of the physical exam, ear, nose, and throat were checked. I listened to your lungs and your heart. And the medical decision making here is straightforward. You have an upper respiratory infection. Or if your whole body aches and we're not quite sure, you're, then your medical decision making could be complicated. There are different levels. The ENM codes are generated based on documentation made by the care provider and are dependent on whether the patient is new or established. So some of these evaluation and management codes depend on whether you're new or established. If you're new, you haven't been seen by the practice for at least three years. If you're established, you've been seen within three years. And they reflect the professional services rendered to a patient. Not all um, visits to a doctor's office are new or established. All right? But your primary care office is. Here's steps in the revenue cycle with medical documentation. Learn the steps, please. You pre-register patients, you establish financial responsibility, you check in patients, and you review and collect new and updated information. You review coding compliance, you review billing compliance, and you check out patients. You prepare and transmit claims, you monitor payment adjudication, you generate payments, patient statements, and you follow up on payments and collections. And this is the revenue cycle. This isn't the MA talking to the patient and what the doctor's doing. This is the revenue cycle. Compliance. What is compliance? Rules and regulations. Insurance plans have rules and regulations related to coding, billing, and collection of healthcare claims. Intentionally not following rules and regulation constitutes fraud and abuse or coding and billing inconsistencies with typical practices. Consequences to fraud and abuse include monetary fines or sanctions from insurance companies such as forbidden from accepting patients who see those plans or reduces the number of patients a provider can see and impacts income. Compliance plan. This is a formal written document that describes how the hospital or practice ensures adherence to rules, regulations, and standards. It defends a healthcare facility in the event that the Office of the Inspector General, the OIG, investigates suspected cases of fraud or abuse. And facilities should be able to demonstrate that all healthcare personnel follow their compliance plans by yearly um, refresher courses, signing documents, and um, keeping the files in the practice manager's office and human resources office. Compliance plan requirements include conducting audits and monitoring work performed by the office staff. These are called internal audits. Developing and implementing standards of practice that are uniformly and consistently applied and appointing of a compliance officer. Training new staff immediately after hire and providing ongoing training or staff development to all staff. Fixing any problems that are found and performing process improvement. Encouraging staff to bring compliance issues to the office administration and enforcing the office's policies and not making exceptions. Having, following, and referencing a practice's written policies, procedures, and compliance ensures the best outcomes for fiscal success and in the event of investigations. And that ends our lengthy lecture today on financial management, insurance, and billing functions.